So I heard about this one college football coach. He was really nervous. He, uh, one of his star receivers was going to go on academic probation. And so he went in the locker room during the practice. He said, son, um, we've got to bring up your math scores or you're going to go on academic dismissal. You can't play on the team. He says, whatever i got to do, coach. And he says, well, you've got to answer some math questions, okay? And he says, whatever i got to do, coach. He says, what's five plus five? He said, 11. He says, no, son, I'm sorry, that's not right. And the rest of the team goes, come on, coach, give him another chance. He goes, okay, what's two plus two? And the receiver says, four. And the rest of the team says, come on, coach, give him another chance. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I forgot my clicker. Some people, it takes longer to get the joke. (laughs) Okay, let's do our Wesley Covenant prayer. Grab your Bible if you have them. And let's jump in. Join along with me. I am no longer my own but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O oh wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine, and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant which we have made on earth, that it also be made in heaven. Amen. Thank you. All right, so for the last three weeks, we've been um, exploring this topic of where God finds us. And we're looking at the different ways that different predicaments people have been in. They weren't even calling for God. And next thing you know, God's coming up and standing beside them. And I got to wondering, how many of you have ever faced a problem like that? Where you're in a predicament, a situation came up, somehow it just magically got resolved. Maybe you uh, responded by saying, wow, God is good. All right? Or maybe God always provides. I find myself saying a lot lately, wow, God is amazing. But what about those times when we think that we have God's favor and things don't go right? We pray and we pray and we pray, but we don't get the outcome that we wanted. I'm not talking about praying for a football team. I'm not worried. The Gators will eventually win one. Maybe two. A and M, maybe one. Two. Oh. But we know how Alabama ends. Uh, I have to live with Alabama. There we go. So in our score, uh, uh, so what I've been talking about is though is uh, those kind of prayers where we're praying. We do everything that God has asked us to do. Or we thought that He's asked us to do. We put it all out there, and. It just doesn't work out. Or maybe worse, it backfires on us. In our scripture this morning, we have the story of Elijah, and that's, that's exactly what happened to him. He obeyed God, and his results were beyond expectations. But God's plan wasn't what he expected it to be. In fact, he ended up running for his life. If you want to join me, we're going to be in in 1 Kings chapter 19. And while you turn there, I'll kind of bring you in on the back story. Does anyone here like wrestling? WWF style wrestling. Anybody here a fan of wrestling? Oh, come on, you know it's real. Every uh, Wednesday night, Becky's dad, he used to live with us, and he had a little apartment downstairs, and every night, Wednesday night, he'd say, I'm going to my hole, wrestling's on. 
Happy would have loved this story out of Elijah. So I'm setting up the scene for you that's in chapter 18, and we're going to start in, in chapter 19 in a moment, but you need to picture this from the Bible. So here you are. We got the WWF match, too many W's, WWF match up on Mount Carmel. And over on, on one side, you've got Elijah, the world reigning champion of the word of the one and only true God. And on the other side, you got the motley prophets of Baal. And they're all decked out in their, their holy regalia, and they're, and they're ready to rumble. But here's the challenge. The prophets set up their altar, each with the bull, and they had to get their God to come down and set fire to the offering. Well, the Baal worshipers, they get to go first. And they go all out, they're dancing around, they're chanting, they've got this high energy, and, and, and they're taunting the God of Elijah. They even knock over Elijah's altar. Nothing happens. So they start shouting some more and screaming some more, and they even start cutting themselves to get attention. But nothing happens. They pull out all the stops. But it's like they're wrestling a ghost. No matter what they do, they cannot get anything out of ball. Nothing will respond. Nothing interacts with their altar. And the funny part is, Elijah starts talking smack. I never thought of a prophet talking smack. What he does, in 1 Kings 18.27, he says to them, Shout louder! Surely he is a god talking about Baal. Perhaps he's deep in thought. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe you have to wake him up. So after an entire full day of trying to invoke their god Baal, they finally give up. Now it's Elijah's turn. And he strides into the ring and he rebuilds his altar. Elijah wants to really put on a show. So he tells them, fill up four of the large jars with water, then pour them over my altar. And they do that, and he says, do it again. And they pour it over the altar, and he says, do it again. And they pour another four jars of water over the altar, so much water over the altar, over the wood, even the trenches around the altar are filled with water. And finally, Elijah raises up his hands, he prays, and suddenly... Wham! Fire burst down from heaven. And the flames consume the bull on the altar. And then they start to consume the wood. And then they start to consume the stones. And next thing you know, the flame is burning and consuming the dirt and drying up all the water in the trenches. And the crowds go wild. They do. They start going, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah's like, yes, I got him right where I want him. Now I know there's no way King Ahab isn't going to say that this is the one and true God. There's no way that Queen Jezebel is not going to give up worshiping Baal and Asherah. He is all excited. Now we get to go to chapter 19, verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. All those prophets that were trying to get their God to come down, they were all sacrificed. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them, a dead prophet. That's what just happened. Jezebel puts a contract out on Elijah. She wants him D-E-A-D, -E dead. And she's furious that his God made her God look impotent. Elijah's afraid and ran for his life. But when he, gets to come, when he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there 
while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down, and he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. So when Elijah dismissed his servant, the servant that the prophet had to assist him, he decided, I'm not going to be a prophet anymore. I'm quitting God. Elijah was done. He's thinking, Lord, look at everything I did, and nothing changed. Here I am, Lord. I am of no use to you. I can't do this anymore. And that's what I was talking about earlier. It's easy to feel defeated when you try and you try and you try and you put everything up to God and nothing happens. And you say, he's not listening to me. Maybe he doesn't even exist. We have teachers here. Technical problems today. So of your teachers here, think about some teachers you've had in your past. Think about that, that one teacher you knew who she, she poured her heart and soul into her students trying to promote kindness and respect. And despite all of her efforts, the principal mocks her. And the children, they just kind of remain indifferent. And she can only take so much of all of this, so she decides, I'm just going to quit teaching. She stops believing that her work even matters, and she quits the kids. We've got lawyers in the house. Don't raise your hand. How many times have you uh, known a young, passionate lawyer that decided they were going to do pro bono work for some low-income clients? So they get busy working with these clients, fighting for justice, and they face setback after setback after setback, and, and the other colleagues start to mock him about the way he's trying to go through stuff. Ultimately, he decides to stop taking pro bono cases because he thinks his efforts aren't worth the struggle. He gives up on those who need him the most. This is what Elijah's doing. Only his case is a lot more serious. He's the walking dead. He asks God to kill him right there under the bottle brush. Well, after he takes a nap. Thinking is, God is always with us. He knows what we're going through. But sometimes we give up on God because we don't understand his plan. Why do we give up? We get tired. We get frustrated. We think we don't matter. Who's going to miss me? Even Elijah hit his breaking points. But I love what God does next. In the rest of chapter, verse 5, he says, All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. All at once an angel touched him. But this isn't an ordinary angel. When you get to verse 7, he's described again in verse 7 it says that the angel of the Lord came back a second time. The angel of the Lord. We talked about this a few weeks ago. It doesn't say a angel. An angel. The angel of the Lord. That means it's God himself. And some scholars will say that by the actions taken, it was probably Jesus. We know the relationship he has with Elijah. Who does he call to his transfiguration but Moses and Elijah? In verse 5, I would say this is exactly like something Jesus would do. 
all at once an angel touched him and said, get up. Jesus touched him. I think sometimes when we're in a really bad place, that's exactly what we need. Someone to just touch us, hug us, give us value. <coughs> Whenever Becky's inside a care facility, a nursing home or a rehab center, she always makes it a point to find a patient who's sitting in a wheelchair alone. Or sitting in the room in the dark, just staring. And she finds them and she touches them. Sometimes she'll just hold their hand. Sometimes it's a hug. But she is convinced that even the tiniest bit of human contact makes all the difference for someone in a dark place. Jesus touched him. And then he fixes them dinner. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is much for you. So he got up, ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. So Horeb, Elijah, he was way far up on Mount Carmel. He escapes to the wilderness. Now he's going to trudge 40 days, 40 nights to this place called the mountain of God. We know it better as Mount Sinai. We know the story about Jesus going up the mountain and talking to God and bringing down the commandments. We know the stories about Jesus, uh, Moses going up to the mountain, sliding into the cleft and seeing the glory of God go by without being destroyed. We know why Elijah is going to Mount Horeb. He wants to talk to God. Jesus touched him. Verse 9, there he went into a cave and he spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Let me pause for a second. I've said several times about how God is always with us. So far, Jesus has touched Elijah. Jesus has fixed him dinner and now Jesus wants to listen to him. Isn't that what a lot of us need when we're in a tough spot? Someone just to listen to us? No conversations, no unsolicited advice, just someone who will be with us and listen. That's what Jesus does. And at Mount Horeb, God says, Tell me about it. What's on your mind, Elijah? I'm with you. Elijah, he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And now... They're trying to kill me too. So Elijah's having this soul-bearing conversation with God. And the reality is, I think he said something he probably shouldn't have said. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. He should have said, or what he might as well have said was, God, did you see what I did? It was incredible. 
I had to pour water over everything. Then the fire came down, burned it all up. They were so impressed. They were chanting your name, God. You should have seen. You should have been there. <laughs> See, Elijah was all about impressing others, wasn't he? He didn't show deference for God. He turned God's power into a circus act. And now Elijah's feeling sorry for himself, and he wants to quit God. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. Elijah is trying to find the almighty, powerful God in the wind, in the earthquake, in the fire. He's trying to find that almighty God of the, that comes in the wind like Job sees at the end of his story. He wants to find the almighty God that makes the ground shake like the Jews saw at the base of Mount Sinai when the, when the mountain rumbled. He wants to see God in the fire like Moses did in the burning bush. He wants to see a mighty God. That's all that matters is seeing a mighty God. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. I really like the King James Version of this text. In the King James Version, it says, after the fire came a still, small voice. A still, small voice. You see, this is exactly what I imagine a conversation with Jesus would sound like. A still, small voice. Jesus is a calm and soothing presence. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak up over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And the voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? See, God's using this rhetorical question to tell Elijah, look, I am always with you, but you're going to quit me? You're going to quit me because the plan didn't go the way you wanted? I kept Jezebel's heart cold and bitter because I have great plans for her destruction. You're the one that quit teaching those students kindness and respect. I'm the one that had the principal mock you because I wanted to make you strong. You're the one that quit those clients that needed you the most because you didn't like the criticism and the complexities. I had your colleagues taunt you because I wanted you to have wisdom because I have a plan for you. You're told you have the rare and curable form of cancer and you gave up on me. But through you, that, God, that doctor is going to discover new ways to save millions of people. I have plans for you. God is always with us. If God knows the number of hairs on your head, how can he not be fully invested in our success in his kingdom? He has a plan for every one of us. After Jesus' crucifixion, the disciples were filled with guilt and fear. Peter's denial, Judah's betrayal, John sitting at the foot of the cross not knowing what to do, uh, James and the other ones going off and hiding. I'm sure they felt just like Elijah when he was under that bottle brush. What just happened? 
Where is our Messiah? During Jesus' entire ministry, the disciples wanted him to do something big. If he was truly the Messiah, he's going to wipe out the Romans. He's going to take care of these Pharisees. We're going to live in peace forever and ever. Why doesn't he just bring down fire and brimstone and get it over with? You know what Jesus said? Luke 12, 49. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it was already kindled. Well, i got other things i got to do first. Haven't we all longed for a show of power? Something great and substantial that would just turn the minds of all those doubters and say, yes, there is only one true sovereign God. But that's not what he does. One evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, in a still, small voice, peace be with you. Why do we have despair and worry? And God is always with us. I get it. We suffer. We have pain. We have struggles. We have challenges that push us to our limits. But God is always with us. He has a plan for us. I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in this little tiny short game of life that we forget about this vast, immense duration of eternity. Because that's when God's going to wipe away every tear. There'll be no more death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. In closing this morning, I encourage you all to just take a moment for yourself. In your own times of struggle, I want you to ask yourself, how can I make space in this crazy, loud, obnoxious political season even, time of year, to find that still, small voice. If you're on the verge of quitting God because you think he's forgotten you, are you even listening for him? Or are you caught up being zealous in your pity party? For those of you that are strong in your faith, and I say this with all my heart because we have so many strong warriors in this house. If you are strong in your faith, please consider reaching out to someone who might be feeling down. Call someone, go see someone who can't make it to church, but they really want to be here. Go visit someone in a nursing home. Go walk the halls and find that person sitting in a wheelchair alone and touch them. Let them feel Jesus' presence through the Christ in you. You can change this world. So let's just commit to listening for that still, small voice and in supporting each other on this journey because we're not alone. God is always with us. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder that you are never far from our side. No matter what we say, do, experience, you're right there with us, Lord. You're right there ready to help us, to guide us, Jesus called the Holy Spirit the gift that you gave to us, our advocate. That at any moment, all we have to do is through our Holy Spirit cry out to you and you'll touch us. You'll feed us through glory. 
and we know that you'll listen. And that's why we love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.